Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me here in my shop, along with Shadow. What we're going to start doing, first thing, is taking a much closer look at these, at this uh, big wheel here and, and this, uh, this wheel down here, which were made from uh, pot metal, which is a alloy. I've read a little bit about it. Thank you very much for those of you who sent me links and stuff like that. I make myself a little more knowledgeable about these materials. So it turns out uh, pot metal is an alloy and because of the way um, these things were, were done in smaller shops and stuff like that, the alloys were poorly controlled. And so if you know anything about alloying metal, um, it's, uh, it's quite a recipe. And you get the recipe right, you get a great piece of metal. You don't get the recipe right, you might get something, uh, for instance, that will uh, crack. And that's what's happened in this case. So I think one of the primary components of this metal is lead and a couple other low temperature metals, metals that melt at low temperatures. And the result is even at room temperature, uh, these metals are not uh, frozen as solid as you might like. And consequently, some chemistry goes on in them, uh, which, which results in this cracking. So. Let's take a closer look. I'm pretty sure it's just this big wheel and, and this one down here. So let, let's take a close look. We'll start with the uh, little wheel. So, yeah. So the cracking of the uh, collar, that's, that's this part of the casting here, which is you know, built or it's bigger, bigger than the rest of the wheel. Uh, could make the whole wheel this big, but that'd be a waste of metal. But they make this part big to give it the mechanical strength it needs to to grip onto the shaft here. And you can see the screw hole. Probably a set screw in there. Can't quite see it. And there's another one on the other side. Oh my gosh, there's one on the top. How many are there? So maybe these aren't set screws. That's I guess there's one underneath here too. Let's try the mirror and see if we can see under there. Now you can look right in there. <laughs> look in the yeah, it's a camera shooting itself. <laughs> I don't see a hole underneath there. It doesn't really matter. It looks like there's at least three of them anyway. Isn't that right? <laughs> hey, look out. <laughs> Thanks for the dental checkup there, Shadow. So this is bad around the collar here, uh, for sure. Um, wow. It's amazing, you know, I turned this a few times, I dialed this radio from uh, one end of the scale to the other. And uh, I'm just amazed that this just didn't fall right apart. But for all I know, it wasn't that badly cracked. Now, I mean, the owner's had this radio for a while. He's tuned it around, so... I have to guess, though, every time you operate and tune this radio, uh, these cracks can, they can only get worse. They can never get better. could be, I don't know if it would be the case, that the pressure in there against the shaft from the uh, cracked metal, the pressure is actually quite high in there perhaps. That's why the uh, cracks are pushing out. It appears to be a sleeve in there. Now that's kind of interesting too. Now in the case of like a wooden knob with a set screw on the side, often there's a metal sleeve inside the wooden knob where you can't see it and that's what's taking the strain. Is it the same thing with this? Now it's just possible that there's something in there like that. Um, I expect it to be a little bit thicker at this point but maybe not. Cracks don't seem to extend into it or do they? Oh. Just 
just looking where that large crack meets the shaft, it looks like the material, the sleeve or whatever that is inside is cracked also. So I don't really know what I'm seeing there, but maybe it's a brass ring. Um, because the people making this casting, they knew this metal was soft. And you know, how's it going to hold the set screw? If, if that means the set screw is not actually threaded into the pop metal, but threaded into a a sleeve inside there. Uh, let's see if we can get a little light on here. A little extra light. Look right inside that hole. appears to be empty. Sorry here, I'm having a little hard to aim the camera in the hole and the light at the same time. I need a headlight right on the camera. Okay, so when we look at how this metal collar, how the pot metal collar is fused to the larger wheel, you know, we get, we could guess it's all cast as one. You know, so there's no cracking around the uh, around it. Cracks come down. And look at that one. You can almost around the uh, circle there, the hole, which looks like it might be s screw da screwdriver damaged a little bit. The crack goes around that hole, like by uh, you know a millimeter or two, right around it. That again is suggesting there's some kind of brass in there or something else. So, you know, this is important. This may mean that I can, I can, pile a bunch of uh, epoxy onto this cracked sleeve here, the uh, hot metal sleeve, just pile it on like crazy. But the glue wouldn't have to hold the wheel to the shaft because the shaft is still being held by the sleeve and it's uh, supposed it's set screws that are in there. Can I, can I see in this one? I can't think, see in this one either. Um, and that, that, that is actually okay. The interior sleeve, if there is one, is actually fixed on the shaft. Just fine. I think you just gotta change cameras here to give an idea of what I'm seeing on my... <laughs> that's, and I'm being hawk-eyed by this cat here. I'm watching everything I do. Hey, stay away. Uh, uh, look at the uh, numbers on this. 2158 and... There's a manufacturer's stamp with a number four on it. So no doubt the issues with making this stuff were enough that they wanted to track it in case there were failures. So they could work back on their mix or their process or something. There was a time where uh, cars were being manufactured. This is probably in the 60s or 70s and the manufacturers began experimenting with galvanized steel uh, especially along the uh, lower parts of your car where the paint was going to get knocked off and there was going to be exposed metal early on in the life of the car so they thought if they galvanized it then there would be zinc there zinc corrodes slowly in an atmosphere and uh, you know eventually that would even provide a little bit of cathodic protection if the zinc is scratched through to the steel and that was a really good idea and I suppose it is except in the manufacturing process there comes a point where the car metal parts have been galvanized and then they need to be coated with paint if if there was a delay in that process and like for instance if they shut the line down for a few hours for some reason and then started up again those particular cars that had been galvanized and had sat in the factory atmosphere for an hour or two uh, would have developed a very very thin uh, oxide or some kind of coating uh, on the zinc and then the subsequent top coat wouldn't hold 
and uh, so the idea was never buy a car that was made on a Friday or something like that. That was the story that came out of it. Okay, so we've looked at this one. Uh, look at that. Let's look at this edge here. Funny how it would kind of crack like that. What are the chances that, that this is a wheel in a wheel? That this is a uh, there isn't the slightest. Oh, oh, I'm going to take it back. I'm going to say there isn't the slightest cracking of the actual slot here. Yeah, hang on, i got to get a better way of moving my camera around here. i bring bringing my expensive dolly. There we are. That's a little better. So I'm going to adjust the focus here. If you just bear with me, we're going to go in as close as we can get away with here. In fact, because of my background as a uh, corrosion technician, um, there was a time where the automobile manufacturers uh, out of Detroit, so this would be the late 60s or something like that, 70s, uh, couponed cars, which means they hung pieces of test metal coated in various ways, galvanized and painted and all kinds of ways of coating them. They hung them under the bottom of cars, test cars that were then driven around Detroit probably in the winter, getting uh, salt and snow and stuff on them. And then they would take all these coupons and, and would uh, examine them. And then out of examining the coupons, they could make decisions about what coating system would be the best to use on their cars. And then, of course, they could sell their cars better by saying, look, we did all this work, they're corrosion resistant. They went through that whole process, specified their new painting system, whatever it was, manufactured cars, and they were among the worst performing cars out there. <laughs> so that stands as a story to all corrosion investigators or corrosion people and uh, people in general. You never really know. Okay, get back to what I was doing here, which was adjusting the focus. Uh, I'm trying to regale you with stories of corrosion. So I'm looking now at the part of the metal that is, forms the slot in which the wire is moving. <laughs> Is there any crack in the piece where the wire goes? See, to me, when I look at this and I see it cracked like this, I think, why isn't it just falling totally apart? Especially with this pressure. There's a lot of pressure on this. On this. It's quite tight. You would think it would just disintegrate this wheel. So I've been wondering this the whole time. How can it be cracked like this and yet sustain the pressure of that of that uh, cable? So is this really like a two-part thing? There's a rigid, strong part that's going to take the strain. Uh, you can almost imagine it coming down and then coming out into here. And then over top of it, it's been covered with this pot metal. Why, why, why in heaven's name would they do that? Well, why would that? Well, look, at here, look at here. This crack right below where the wire is. I feel like picking some of that away, but I think that's kind of a stupid move. I'd love to pick it away because I see it looks like an internal space being revealed just below the, uh, I don't know what to call it, the pulley track, or, or or they sort of put in kind of like a hardened running surface, if I can call it that, like a, uh, and, and then somehow cast this other metal to grab it and hold it. Yeah, I should really start picking at this, but I just so reticent to, to do that. 
I also know that when you're looking at things like this, time is on your side. The longer you spend looking at it, the more the more you see. So here's the same sort of thing. Look, it's just cracked right away. Yet that upper upper track part seems really, really solid. I don't see any uh, radial cracks going. I don't see any cracks in it. Hmm. Okay, so, you know, this might look like crap, but it might be totally functional. I had tuned the radio. It, it did work. Okay, so let's look at this pulley. Now, this pulley looks like it's all metal. All regular metal. There's no cracking problem there. Okay, so I'll follow this cable up, and we're getting into the next piece here. Now... So I see a crack extending right through the track, if you like. See, it's coming from this screw. The screw is holding this plastic uh, dial. You can see the screw, it looks like the screw has disrupted it. Imagine that screw going in and supplying pressure. That's just totally cracked everywhere along here, isn't it? Now, is this the same deal? See the track? another crack going right into the track. I don't know if you can see that or not, but uh, here, but it's like dead center of the screen right now. There's a crack going through the, the track. Again, look, see, here's the spring that's putting the pressure on. That's no small spring. And then this a spring is, is attached here. Whoops, I've run out of wire. Hang on here. There we go. My wire was kind of tangled up there. Okay, where were we? We were up on top here. Okay, so we're looking at where the spring is attached. And you can imagine a huge amount of stress right in here. Cracks on it. Just put this light. Get it over here like that. See, again, I would expect this to just have completely crumbled apart with the kind of cracking that's on it. Like I could just take my fingers here and just pull on this, and off it would come. I'm not trying to pull it off. I'm trying to feel if any of it is loose. But, you know, it doesn't feel... Look at this piece, the little piece on the top here. It doesn't seem to be loose. As much as it looks like a blow on it, it would fall off. Okay, so... Now look at that. You know, again, it looks like a kind of metal in the middle, and then this pot metal has been applied to it. can hear a difference here. Let's try this. Yeah, I'm not going to hear any difference. <laughs> I don't know what, what exactly is. Oh, look at that. Okay, well that pretty much settles the issue of whether these things can crack right through. So one of the early problems with uh, concrete was created by engineers trying to improve things. So I'll give you an example. In, uh, in the city of Toronto, uh, in the downtown area, there's some old there's an old train station, like any big city, and uh, lots of tracks coming in. The train station is actually elevated uh, a story or two above the natural ground, and roads are dug down to go underneath through large uh, subway tunnels, or just tunnels, uh, underneath the tracks, um, right, at, right, right in the down, right in the waterfront area of Toronto. Been there for a hundred years, like that. Uh, been there a hundred years. And if you look at those concrete 
subway tunnels, there's no spalling, there's no cracking. They look, they look the same as they looked the day they were made. The one thing about them is they are huge. They are thick, feet, feet thick of concrete. Um, real monsters. So there's an, a, a abutment, if you like, coming out for a screw to go through. I can't quite see the screw here. To hold the plastic part on. Look at that. It's just... So, going back to the bridge stories. You can see these bridges, they have a plaque in them like so many bridges. It gives the year they were made, like 1911 or something like that. They look fantastic. They have great, big, fat, stocky... Um, support pillars in the middle of the road, you know, so you traffic goes on either side of these pillars. hundred years later, it's still, it's still there looking great. Right next to it is another structure built in the 1950s. Also a concrete bridge structure. It's an elevated highway like so many cities have from back then. Um, but that structure is falling apart. Uh, concrete's falling off of it. It's bad enough that from time to time they have to close the road below it because concrete spalls off and uh, hits the uh, hits the cars. So, 1910 bridge, perfect. 100 years later, looks like it's good for another couple hundred years. No maintenance, no nothing. Super highway elevated above it falling apart, requiring millions and millions in reconstruction. Why? Because engineers thought they could get away with way less concrete. Wow, look at this. Way less concrete by sticking in reinforcing rods. Okay, so early studies were done on this. And listen to me now and cry after you hear what I'm going to say. Those studies discovered that if you don't have three inches of concrete or something like that above your reinforcing rod in other words if if you can dig into the concrete and find the reinforcing rods less than three inches from the surface over time chlorides and other uh, corrosion inducing and conductive materials will soak into the concrete the concrete is porous reach the reinforcing rods and they will begin to rust steel rust is seven times the diameter or volume rather of the original steel seven times that's why that's why rust uh, piles up and flakes off by the way it's also why steel doesn't stop corroding the rust can't form a tightly adherent surface can't can't, can't uh, uh, tightly adherent material on the surface of the steel like it can with stainless steel wow you know, this just looks horrendous here, doesn't it? Look at look at the crack going right up into this area. There's no doubt where the set screw is here. Is there some brass ring or something? Again, there appears to be a sleeve in there. Thin thin sleeve. So the thing about the concrete and three inches on top of the reinforcing rods is it kind of undoes the whole advantage. You end up with a big honking structure, you know, major uh, loads of concrete with steel inside. So somewhere, and then this was this was worked out in the 1920s. Okay, so I read a report about it in the 1920s. This was all worked out. written down in a uh, American government document that's uh, shared publicly. Everybody could look at it. Uh, I read this thing. I found it at where I worked. In the power company I worked had a copy of this thing. Can you believe it? I found it and I read it. I was stunned. So in the case of the example I was giving, the lower structure that's still there after 100 years has no reinforcing steel in it. There's nothing to rust and nothing to push apart the concrete from the inside. Meanwhile, the expressway up above, it's called the Gardner Expressway, by the way, in case you want to go look at a picture of it. It looks like so many elevated highways. Uh, the engineers who built that did not put three inches of concrete because where's the economy in that? Well, the economy is 
if they did it right, that structure would sit there for 50, 100 years. But instead, it lasts about 30 years, and it just looks like this. It looks like this. It looks like what we're looking at here. So, you know, engineering going backwards. Now, this, this problem of uh, reinforcing rods spalling concrete because of lack of cover is everywhere. Uh, virtually every bridge in North America is suffering from this. Bridge deck failures. Uh, it's, it's really bad, bad situation. Uh, parking lot garages are a horror story. This was a big issue 30, 40 years ago. You don't hear much about it anymore. 30 years ago, I guess. You don't hear a lot about it. I think today, when they build structures, they're a lot more careful about this. Okay, so I've looked this thing over pretty thoroughly. Uh, wow, it is in bad shape. Like, when you when you look at it right, right here, right, right where these uh, spokes come into the hub, right in here. I turn this, actually I'm turning it on the outside, here's where the power is being delivered to the outside. And that's going to put stress right in here, right, right in here. And basically these are the hands grabbing onto this, trying to turn this. Uh, one thing I can do here that would help is lubricate all the friction points to make sure that there isn't any, uh, any back. Oh, can you hear that? That's my alarm telling me my cat's been outside for half an hour. Let me look at the other side of this shaft here a little bit. That crack right through it. Wow. So, you know, and a question would be, well, can you do something to this with it in place, sitting like this? Is, is there something I can do? Just run uh, compounds all over this thing? Cheapers. Uh, compounds. Uh, epoxy glue, something like that. Look at that metal. That's pretty strange looking too, isn't it? Well, you know, this was made in 1929, so they were doing what they knew how to do. Some of this stuff would have come from, you know, industries like shipbuilding. And that looks to me like a lead, a lead sleeve here. I gotta go. I gotta go get my cat. I don't see any cracking in any of this though. So, different alloy. Very large crystals. Look, look at the crystals in the uh, metal is crystal. It's interesting how they made that. Not cracking though. Looks looks pretty solid. Oh, we gotta take a look at this guy at the end here too. Okay, so I'm gonna go save my cat. He's out in the sun. Probably doesn't even want to come in. He's probably happy to stay out there. So what did I tell you about? I told you about the failure of concrete structures worldwide because of engineering advancements that actually went backwards. And we pay, we pay a huge price for this, this error, this small error, and people attempting to build structures and reduce the capital cost on the front end, especially uh, public endeavors because people are freaked out about the cost of things. So they try to drop the front end capital cost. Don't put quite so much concrete on your structure. Just put that much, that'll be okay. You know, that kind of stuff. And in the end, no economy. Uh, economy's lost. Think about all those people who built buildings, like churches, for instance. Churches and mosques built, you know, a thousand years ago, and those things are still standing straight and true. So it can be done. It can be done. Okay, I'm going to go save my cat now. Okay, so here's what was waiting for me. Well, you can see something like this on camera. There he is. <laughs> and I walk upstairs and he's looking in the door there. Uh, I love my cats. Uh, he's in the house now. Yeah.
happy in the house. I think his face is in the food bowl in the pack. So what are my options here with this crack stuff? Well, you know, the first one is do nothing. Leave everything as is. Don't do anything that might make it worse. So uh, time is going to make this worse. Uh, storing this thing at a high temperature will make it worse. It will actually speed up this process. What can you do about that? Uh, putting it through temperature variations. Putting it somewhere where its temperature cycles a lot. And that includes operating it. Operating it will warm it up a little bit. But you know, if you put this, uh, let's say, out in my garage, that'd be bad. Uh, very bad. I'm not about to do that. This has lived its life indoors, I'm pretty sure. Judge from judging from the cabinet. Um, tuning it around, tuning it. Do I really need to tune this thing to carry on with it? Well, there is some alignment stages where you're supposed to tune this all the way one way, do some stuff, tune it all the way other way, do some stuff. That that is not. I'm not recommending that. This is not a radio that anyone really wants to sit and listen to the radio. Uh, if you're really interested in listening to AM radio, you're going to use a modern radio. You're not going to use this guy. So this guy's going to sit somewhere looking beautiful in the cabinet, and occasionally the owner is going to want to demonstrate it to his friends that, hey, look at this. And for his own sake, going to want to hear it once in a while. Hey, look at this. Turn it on and presto. So the presto would happen if the radio was tuned to a strong station. There's a couple of strong stations uh, where this radio lives. Uh, same stations are strong here in my house. 640 AM is the one that, that really works well here. So another one of my options, and this is the one I've been thinking about for quite a bit here, tune this guy to 640, a, a station that's strong, leave it, and carry on from there. That's probably where we're going with this. I mean, I've tuned this back and forth willy-nilly at first, even while it was in the cabinet. Boy, I better remember to never do that again. Never, never do that again. If, if a radio like this is in my hands, and while it's in my hands, a part like this should fail entirely, I'm going to feel really bad, and the owner is not going to be happy at all. He's trusting me with this thing. And... Uh, as much as you want to move it forward, the things you're doing can move it backwards. I don't want that to happen. You know, we have another thing to examine here really closely, and that's that's this part of the radio. Um, bring this more in view here. So I'm pretty sure this is a device that was called a variometer. You won't find these in radios anymore because look at the size of this. To make this thing work you have to have these fairly large coils here. And the idea of a variometer is it's just a clever way to enable a coil to change its uh, impedance or its, its, its react reactivity, I guess it might be a better word. And essentially it's, it's a coil, a single coil, single coil split in two still still wired together and then one part stuck inside itself in such a way that by rotating the part inside you can enhance or interfere with the uh, reactance the reactive impedance that's uh, inherent with a coil inherent with a piece of wire too by the way so it's a clever way to make a variable inductor. And it's really what it boils down to. Um, but because of the techniques that are used, it got this name called variometer. Now it's hooked up to the central shaft, so when you tune the radio, you're rotating this part in here. Now back before I knew there was a problem with tuning it, I was tuning this back and forth, I noticed that even as I turned this, so, and this is moving. This didn't seem to move at times. It seemed to be slipping on the shaft as if there was a, a, a playroom in it, like like play in a steering wheel, kind of. Uh, 
Is that a valid observation? I'm not exactly sure. And I don't want to test it by doing this right now. Let's take a close look at it and see what we can see. As far as I know, everything is fine with it except for that slipping thing that I just described. Okay, so this is fairly close in. Here, let me get my own big screen TV going here. Okay. There's the wire turns. one of the uh, see, part of the, the problem here with this is me getting light on it here um, it, that's my cat I just let in um, you, uh, you you want this internal coil to rotate but somehow it has to be electrically connected started paying attention to him, he just left. Okay. Maybe he thinks I'm going to follow him. Back to what we were doing. Apparently it takes 12 minutes to recover from any interruption in your chain of thought. <laughs> it's, I'm permanently in a state of interruption that never ends here. So there's another batch of coil on the other side of this band here. You can see the other part of the coil on the outside. Pretty close, eh? Look at that. Right up close. There's there's the windings. Square. A real square little feller. So let's follow the wire leads. Where are they? Here they are, they're down here. Oh, this is one. The two wires coming to it. What's that? Looks like a joint. Uh, those things are going to be uh, legal in Canada very soon. like it's locked on that shaft pretty thoroughly, doesn't it? How could that shaft slip inside that? Could, could it? If I'm going to tune the radio to 640, then during that tuning process I get a chance to fiddle and observe this thing too. I mean, realistically, if I tune this thing to 640, I don't expect the wheel to, you know, explode into pieces during that process. I, I really don't. So, so far I've only found one, one wire coming to this thing. So, chances are, well, two, two wires, but the one terminal. Chances are the other terminal is the actual shaft and ground. there. Now, this is not metal. Wait, it is metal. How do you chip metal? Okay, I don't know what that is. 
don't think it's important. Oh, those cracks. Hmm. I'm pretty sure this is not hot metal, this whole frame here. No cracks on it anywhere. Look, it's soldered to I don't think you can solder to pot metal. That's the ground strap. And you can see as you as you rotate the tuning shaft, this this it takes up and lets out slack. That's what keeps this shaft tied to the chassis. All the way through and back into here. There's a split, it looks like a split ring, split uh, sleeve. And so when you crank down this screw, you pinch it and look, the screw has to be passing right through the, cent the actual shaft that's coming into this thing. So wait a minute, so this is the drive shaft coming from the radio. There's no, there's no drive pushing through out to here. This is just riding along. What's it riding on? What's it riding on? This, 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 this is just floating out here. So this, this part is simply attached to these plastic housings. There's some nice plastic here. Of course, it's not probably plastic as we know it. It's probably a resin, a pressed resin material, probably a molded resin material, maybe wood fibers and some kind of, of resin in here. Very much like uh, Bakelite. Bakelite. This could even be Bakelite. If we cleaned it up, it might have that Bakelite look to it. Uh, Bakelite's a wonderful material. It's extremely stable. Uh, it will crack too if you put pressure on it. But mostly, no. Really seeing anything wrong with this thing? I'm getting tired of looking at it. Okay, so I think the plan here is we're going to tune this radio to 640. We're going to find out if it can pick up that station on an antenna. At the same time, we're going to make observations about what goes on with this thing. I'm going to try to kill six birds with three stones here. What I've got to keep an eye on, um, how, how, how do I know that turning this knob, I am not three seconds from disaster? What do I see in the first second that tells me, oh, I turned it already. <laughs> there you go. Look, I turned this a little bit and this didn't move. There you go. You know what, this isn't moving either. Oh no, that's bad, that's very, very bad. It's bad and good at the same time. It means I can actually independently tune these by making, doing this while this doesn't move. And that's because... Let's put this camera over here and look at the shaft. I think, I think we're going to find out that this thing is really actually... Really, this is a seriously bad shape. Up until now, it's been kind of a looks really bad. Come on, camera. Stay there. So I think what we're going to see is when I move the capacitor, we're going to see that center shaft turn relative to the outside here. Here we go. Yeah, there it is. So we, we already have one of the conditions I was hoping to avoid. And no doubt when you turn this far enough, it, it grabs there. See, it's grabbing a bit. This, this is the play I saw in the steering wheel. Now one option is to just tighten this set screw down. Who's in favor of that? 
So, you know, that might, might give you a temporary solution here. But in the long run, it's just going to see the crack right on the edge of my finger. Right there, that crack. It's just going to finish this off. You can still see that internal sleeve, though. If, if there's a large sleeve in here, maybe a brass sleeve or something, to take the strain of the set screw, then why, why tightening the set screw would crack this? And maybe that's maybe that's why it hasn't completely shattered in here. Uh, going a little further, if the set screw is not held by the pot metal, why is it loose? Why why, why is this slipping on the shaft? It, it's almost certain that the giving out of the pot metal has released the screw a little bit, and voila, no more pressure on the center shaft. Shaft. The shaft may even even have a spot kind of dug into it here, especially if this has been tuned a fair bit. This this set screw may be uh, inscribing a slot or a uh, scrape mark or something like that in the center shaft, and that's why you're getting this, this play to a distance, and then it, then it catches. You've reached the end of the dug out area, if you know what I mean. So some, somebody, it's quite possible somebody came along and has tightened all these screws previously because of this kind of problem. Oh, there's two set screws. Look, there's another one down here, of course. It really looks like if I tighten that screw, it's just going to rip this metal apart. There can be cracks in here we can't even see. They're microscopic still. Okay, so uh, that, now that's all pretty interesting stuff. Uh, looks to me like to tune this radio to a good spot like 640, we're going to want the front panel to say 640, and we're going to want the capacitors to be in the 640 position. A thought just came to my mind, which is to release the set screws over here. So this thing is completely loose and never grabs the center shaft anymore. Uh, the reason for doing that is to ensure nobody tunes this. This is not the best idea, but nobody tunes this. It stays on 640 forever. It's not so good because you need a little fine tuning now and then. It's just inevitable. We, we, we need a little of this action still coming through. Oh, that's, a, that's really a problem with it like this. Rotating this and leaving this sitting still, I think that's pretty harmless. I think where it catches, right there, right here, okay, if I force it past this, it's a pretty solid bump there, by the way. If I force it past this, this point, then conceivably I'm, I'm sl sliding something inside where it's pushing out now. The bottom of the set screw, show this right, is, is uh, you know, it's, it's hitting the shaft. I rotate this, for some reason it pushes harder now, that's where the grip is happening. Now all I've done is increase the hoop stress, the, the force pushing outwards on the, uh, on the pop metal where the set screw is. Well, I don't see a problem with moving this to 640. <laughs> After all that, we're going there. Okay, we're going to try to get there together. Okay, so this is saying 680 here. Let's go a little further. So it's roughly 640. So this is roughly in the right place. It's still play in it. Oops. Oh, a lot of play. It's all that. Okay, so I gotta hope to tune 640 in there. Okay, I'm gonna set up some equipment to do that. Okay, I think we're ready to carry on. Got my signal generator switched on here. 
set it to 640 or so. And we're going to switch on the radio. That should be just fine. Okay, we're still relying on the field coil on the old speaker. Good show, everything's ready to go. Still not sure what this one does. Tone, this has got to be tone. I don't have 100% certainty on this yet. Okay, everything's fine, full. Full. Full, full, full. Volume up. Let's really test my patience warming this radio up. So with the hum going. Where's all that lovely interference we heard yesterday on here? Of course I tuned the radio. Did I? Did I tune it? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Okay, well let's just play around with the signal generator here and see. Signal. Oh, what happened there? Okay. It's another one of these effects that uh, I never know what to make of. So the radio has gone from dead to full of life while I was in the process of shoving a signal into it. Sometimes it seems to me that there are situations where things are supposed to be making contact. Electrically, they aren't. Then you put a little a little charge you manage to drive a spark between them or something and now they conduct after that. Ooh. So it's this tube. Okay. Now we got something to look at about this tube. But it's good now. We're good now. We're good. We're good. Uh, frequency is 646. 660. So we want to go back a bit. Notice you can touch these plates. But these ones will affect it. But these ones won't. There we go. Okay, so we're, we're sending a signal at 640 now. I'm going to try to tune it in here. I think I hear the radio uh, s station in the background too. Okay, so that's 640. Let's check that. Up, up, up. Up, up, up. I'm putting the antenna on here. Very lousy antenna. Okay, signal generator off. Put this wiring to turn the volume down a little bit.
an 0640. What's this? It's a tuning aid. Powerful. So this receiver sensitivity is really, really high now. Why aren't we hearing 640? So I have the short antenna hooked up to the long antenna input. Short antenna input. It's quieter. That's a little counterintuitive. You think uh, the shorter antenna connection would be more sensitive. Let's just double check the tuning frequency here. Oh yeah, kind of need this to be connected. Let's just bring it up close. Hmm. It's a little, just a little surprising. Oh, it's there. Six forty exactly. So what we need in here is a different antenna. I'm going to bring in my uh, loop antenna. We'll hook up the loop antenna here, and I think we're going to be stunned at what we hear. Okay, just just in case you haven't seen this before, this is my home-built loop antenna. It has a tuning capacitor down there. It's your very simple. Uh, the loop antenna is very directional. Let's just hook it up with this. Short or long antenna? I don't know. Let's go on the long one. Seem to be more sensitive. Now the loop antenna is a tuned, a tuned item also. So it gets a little busy here. Let's turn it up. Cut the rear office. Cut the overhead. I'm in. Absolutely, sign me up 100%. But I think the problem is, I was reading someone again, this is on Twitter over the weekend, I was just watching some guys talk about this. The Ford announcement, one guy was talking about how he's been operating a, a business for about, about 15 years, uh, which is roughly the time the Ontario Liberals have been in government, I remind you. And over the That's the null. These antennas have an excellent null. The peak is not so good, it's the null. Look at that, I'm able to null out powerful oh, AM stations. monthly hydro bill had gone from 600 bucks a month to 3,000 bucks a month. So let's just talk about the spread there. Let's just talk about the delta. 600 to 3,000 means you had to grow your monthly business after tax by, tw uh, by 2,400 bucks every month just to keep up with power. You haven't given yourself a raise. You haven't actually grown the business. You haven't expanded it. You haven't had the ability to grow your capital and maybe buy some more equipment or hire some more employees. If you've been able to add it... Oh, they're talking about the power system in Ontario, which is a publicly operated utility. Most recently, the current government has sold vast, well, almost half of it, half, like billions of dollars worth of of uh, distribution, transmission equipment and the like uh, to investors or investors have been allowed to invest in it through uh, purchase of shares. And there's been this, this steady march since the early 90s towards taking the public system 
and changing it to a private system. Now, even though all over the world this has been done and then rejected, like a big story in England was privatize the electric system, everybody in it got wealthy, throw the bums out, let the government take over again, a debt-ridden system. I, I may, may not be accurate, okay, so if you're British, I didn't give you a, a fair shake there, sorry. But in the meantime, here in my jurisdiction, of my, my province of Ontario, the government has continued to just slowly work towards privatization. And all that's happened this whole time is the cost of electricity has been going up and up and up, even though it's all still publicly held by title, even though there are private investors in it now, publicly held by title and controlled thoroughly by regulation. Pricing up, up, up. That's what they're complaining about on the radio. Most recently, the government just threw fiat, ju ju just threw command, pushed the price down. And we're all supposed to be happy here now. And I'm not going to get into it. I used to work in this industry. I have a lot to say, but I won't. I won't say it. <laughs> because what I say doesn't matter anyway. I'm not part of it anymore. I was only a little tiny part anyway, a little, little teeny tiny part of it. Yeah, it's too bad. Now the part I have is I have to pay my monthly bill. And what is the monthly bill? So I'm in a typical house, a typical energy consumption, nothing unusual going on, even though I have this shop here. It's really nothing unusual. And so my power bill runs around 130 a month, somewhere in that range, Canadian dollars. Probably comparable to lots of places, but the point is it should be really cheap here. Much of our electricity is generated almost for free in plants that were built 60 years ago running on falling water. Uh, falling water is solar power, by the way. It's the greatest solar power. How does the water get to the top of the hill? The sun puts it up there for you. Solar energy, fantastic. We have falling water resources all over the place. Niagara Falls, of course, being the, the big hunk on Whopper. And all that capital cost, those plants were built a lot, you know, uh, generations ago, to use an interesting word on that. Yeah, here we are paying this huge price. So, you know, question marks all over the place around me. Who's getting the money? What's going on? Anyway, not to dwell on that. Sorry, it's a pet, pet topic of mine. I should not dwell on it. So, radio's been operating a long time now. Full power. It's picking up 640. 15,328 is the range. The only reason I go into those stories is it has to do with electricity, and so all of you, or many of you, are electrical type people, so you might be curious. So next thing, we're going to do a sensitivity study on these guys. So these are the trimmers. These are the trimmers that make sure each of these individual radios here, there's three of them in a row, are all tuned exactly to 640. Sounds pretty good already, but let's see if we can muck it up. Just doing this by ear. This is a sensitivity study. We need a flag. Eighteen one hundredths of a one hundredth of a dollar. That's what they're reporting. There's my flag. This one sounds like better here. That's where it was. Let me show you up on the close-up camera what's going on here. It's kind of really shows you what a capacitor is. No question how this capacitor works. And once you get it open a fair bit, the capacitance doesn't change much. Yeah, 
Creek Bridge, start in the low 300, and the Freehold Tower start in the upper 300. Visit FairCreekBridge.ca for more information on our new releases in April. Because I don't think the radio is tuned in quite right. Let's. So, you know, if, if I'm starting to open all these capacitors, then what that really means is this thing is not, this, this is not tuned quite right. So let's close these a little bit. So they're in their con uh, control range. And we'll tune this to be loudest here. Certainly this is better done with an instrument, but I'm just doing it by ear right now. I, I want to know, A, these things work, and uh, it doesn't indicate there's more. Holy crap, if I were to talk that fast, you would never know what I think it is. Let me get that. It still wants to come way open. Okay, that's good. So, this is what we hear with the loop antenna. I'm not going to switch back to the wire antenna. Now, the, the fact is, unfortunately, changing antennas can influence the tuning of the radio slightly. Now, hopefully they build these things so that doesn't happen, but... ground. Now we'll double check and make sure this is still receiving 640. It's close enough to 640 that if, 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 and it's bound to be there. Let me fool around this antenna a little bit. Wow, I'll ever go quiet. I just picked it up off the floor, basically. tempted to tune this but I don't want to. So I think you know I'm saying this to a number of owners of this vintage of radio you must get a loop antenna if you really want to enjoy these radios. 
really and, and you know that's perfectly expectable back in 1929 that this radio would be connected to a loop antenna perfectly possible so that's my uh, oh I didn't hook up the loop antenna <laughs> that's the signal generator okay no problem Loop on here. I hear a cat knocking at my door. Scratching. Come on in. Come on in. They plan to abandon the platform altogether. Facebook has been under fire for its ability to protect user privacy. Now we want to listen to this signal very carefully on the, on the assumption that my speaker is good. It's a, it's a pretty good assumption uh, that anything we hear in the sound that's not quite right probably reflects back to the radio itself in some way. So you want to listen to the bass. Is it, is it nice and smooth or has it got a bit of a rumble in it? And the treble is the treble nice and sharp. And my videos, uh, the sound of my videos are really good. So you're hearing exactly what I'm hearing. So is the S sounding like that, or is it more like, or is it not there at all? Shadow, I was talking to you. You ready? Let's listen now very carefully to it. Cloud with some rain starting up in the afternoon, windy and a high of four. For Wednesday, rain with a high of ten. It is two degrees at Chorus Key and Tina Trajani. This is Global News Radio, 640 Toronto. You're listening to the exchange with Matt Gurney on Global News Radio, 640 Toronto. Well, there was a bit of a close call last week where the government's marijuana legalization or cannabis legalization, I don't even know what term we're supposed to be using anymore, pot, weed, dope, whatever, uh, where there was a bill in the Senate that if it hadn't passed, the entire attempt to legalize whatever by the summer was going to fall apart. It just wouldn't hold together because it was a legislative uh, do or die moment. And the liberals, uh, having declared a series of senators independent, suddenly realized that they might not have enough votes in the Senate to actually pass the bill in the face of conservative opposition. So the Liberals ended up uh, whipping a bunch of independent senators. Now, whipping, of course, is the legislative term for, you know, enforcing discipline and making sure enough people show up to make sure the book uh, carries. So it kind of brings into question whether or not these senators are actually independent or not. I'm just kidding. Everybody knows they're really not. It's just a branding thing. However, uh, the vote did end up narrowly passing, so the marijuana legalization effort does continue apace. One of the things we've learned... Yeah, that's right. Marijuana is going to be legal right across Canada in just a few months. Um, I think that I think that's a great thing. Stop punishing people for a crime that has no victim. And uh, of course, the politics are becoming a little difficult right at the last minute. And I mentioned the Canadian Senate. I know a lot of you watching my videos are Americans. Our our Senate is not like your Senate at all. Your your Senate is an elected Senate, so it has the authority of an election behind it. It has a constituency. Our Senate is actually appointed by the government of the day, a little bit like your um, the American uh, Supreme Court is appointed. The politicians of the day, those who have power, get to fill vacancies. The same sort of thing in the Senate, and it's the same sort of effect that the Senate is about uh, I don't know, 200 and something people tends to be a slowly evolving organization because a few people drop off and some more are appointed and so generally they represent a fairly good average of what's been going on politically in Canada now in the past those appointments were political in fact the previous government was strongly political appointments they appointed their buddies hey go take a seat in the Senate take a salary have lots of fun doing arguments in the end the Senate the Canadian Senate's authority is fairly limited and generally what they work on is uh, it's very very different from the American model the Canadian model the elected house puts together some legislation passes it then it has to go uh, to the uh, Senate uh, for a review and so we consider this to be the house of sober second thought and these appointed people 
who, who are uh, significant Canadians. You know, they have, a, they have they have a history. They were great Canadians. They did something wonderful, or whatever, when they were in private citizens, and kind of as a reward and a show of respect, they get to sit in the Senate, even though it's a lot of work, and you got to be in Ottawa. So, uh, so our le legislation goes into the Senate. They review it. Usually, they make improvements to it. They 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 look at the wording. They go, oh, you know what? This is worded vaguely. This can be interpreted this way. That they clean it up. Uh, they don't make any significant changes to it, but they can they can say, you know, this ain't good enough for the Canadian people in our opinion, and they can repel it back to our House of Commons, who can then work on it some more. But eventually, it gets pushed through the Senate. The Senate cannot stop things entirely. So that's what they're talking about here, the pot legislation. It's all coming to a pinnacle because it's supposed to, the market's supposed to open in a couple of months, and now the Senate, the unelected Senate, is interfering with the process of the elected House. So that's kind of the political dynamics that happen in Canada. Uh, even though the word Senate is used, and we have a bicameral system similar to the United States, it's, it's not really similar. It, it's really quite different. So someday I'll explain the difference in the executive operations of the two countries, but not right now, because that's enough. That's enough. That'd be enough. So they're not buying the wrong products. They're buying the products that they want for their desired outcome. So, uh, I mean, that's a huge, huge red flag with it. And then the second side to that is it does make... Now, I'm pretty sure there's some more adjustments on this radio on the back side. Let's see if we can get a look and verify that. The reason I think that... Is typically a radio like this has more more adjustments. <laughs> it typically does, and there's some mysterious holes on the backside, uh, which I'm going to need my mirror to look at. Big big holes back there. Kind of there they are. You can see them there. Now if I get my flashlight, shine it into the mirror. And it will shine in the holes. And guess what I can see back there? And yeah, this may not work on camera. Okay, I gotta get. What I gotta do is I gotta get my eyes right where the camera is, so I see what the camera sees. And then there we are. Now, hopefully, you can see what I'm seeing. Well, oh, so there's a screw, right? You can't see it because of the tube. Okay, why well, don't I just move this move myself over here? No, you know I gotta move the camera. That's what I gotta do. Okay, here we go. Did that get into the camera? It kind of did. It kind of did. So back in there is a hex screw. <laughs> there. Way back there is a hex screw. And that's what we're supposed to be turning? I guess so. Way in there. There's also this little screw. Can you see it? There, that's better. A little screw in the littler hole, which operated a rheostat. That's the phono input. That's the speaker output. Oh, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? I gotta look here. <laughs> uh, okay, enough of the mirror stuff. I'm all confused with it. I'm good. So, okay, as, as an alignment issue, I don't think there is one right now. Interestingly enough, those old paper capacitors seem to not be causing a problem in this radio. It seems to be working good. Quite good. I'm going to ask myself now, why, why would I bother changing them? What would I hope to achieve in that? This particular one is still cranked quite a ways open. Could be because of an old capacitor involved in this somewhere. But it's working. It's still within range. You can hear the radio. You can hear the radio. Sounds sounds great, in fact. 
me pop up on my own screen here my list of things to do. Let's see. Examine metal parts, replace four or five paper capacitors, check the grid leak resistor and capacitor in the detector circuit, investigate the variometer, consider a resistor to replace old speaker field coil, uh, check out the light bulb, align the tuning trimmers, test the radio sensitivity, um, use a sweep generator and oscilloscope, test it on the loop antenna, design the placement of the new speaker in the cabinet, replace the grill cloth on the cabinet, replace the back cloth on the cabinet, install the radio back in the cabinet and do one final test. And that's what I think I have in front of me. But I've done some of those things here today. Okay, so I'm going to think about the capacitors and uh, well, I check the grid leak resistor and capacitor. I kind of check it by listening here. Earlier when I talked about listening for distortion, that's actually what it was in my head was the grid leak capacitor combination not working well, then the uh, grid uh, bias won't be correct and you'll end up with bad sound. It doesn't sound bad. All these circuits back in here are so high impedance that pretty much any instrumentation applied to these circuits throws them off enough that you can't get a valid result. That's my Oh, you know what I never touched? Go check out the oh, cannabis. Oh my gosh. That it is honestly one the best way I can describe it, and someone in an email actually put it to me uh, well. It's like if uh, I, I compared it to the little flags you put in like a minefield to like mark where there's unexploded ordnance. And someone said I was half right. It's what would happen if one of those flags had a baby with the Winnipeg Jets logo really good way of putting it. So it's what would happen if the Winnipeg Jets logo had a love child with a flag you put in a field to warn people of unexploded munitions. That is what the upcoming cannabis packaging will look like in Canada. Because of course, we're getting tough on the black market. <laughs> come back in a few minutes. Lots more to come. The exchange continues right after this on Global News Radio 640 Toronto. Earn $250 in Scotia Rewards points for travel with the new Scotiabank Passport Visa Infinite Card. This guy's working really well. I mean, <laughs> if just about anything I do to it now is going to weaken it. So I think this is where I'm at. On the cracked components and parts, you know, I don't know what to do about them. I have no experience with them. Best thing for me to do is return this radio set to this channel, this frequency, and tell the owner, which I have already, just leave it alone. Uh, this is not something you're going to go listening to, you know, DXing at night with. But certainly you can turn it on and listen to it all you like. Small amount of tuning is possible. If you really want to reach in the back and move these things, you could do all that. You can do just what I did. Just don't turn the, the knob. The window is going to show roughly 640. It's appropriate. I think that's where we are with this crack stuff. I'm just going to leave it because uh, it seems to have enough rigidity to hold itself together. And what am I doing by pouring crap all over it? I'm, I, you know, really. And is it going to help in the end? I don't know how to fix this properly. I really don't. Uh, so you know, somewhere down the road, this probably will fail. Even with all this mechanism failed, it's pretty much failed now, but totally failed. You can still operate the radio. You can still move these things by hand. You can still make the radio work. It's just this front end part. So, yeah, I'm convinced myself. Hey, I'm talking a lot. Okay, Shadow, what do you say we go do some other stuff now? Thanks so much for for watching, and I hope you're finding this uh, interesting. Uh, I gotta think now what I really want to do with it next. Shadow, say goodbye.